Welcome back everyone. Okay, so let's talk about some of the books that I read this month. I found that I actually read a lot more classics this month, uh, but I did manage to get a couple of fantasy books in, and one of those fantasy books was also semi-gothic literature as well, so we've still got managed to get a bit of a mix this month. But I will start with the classics, and I will start with a book that I've been continually talking about on this channel because I'm still making my way through it, and that is Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen once again. Uh, I'm now on book five of The Fairy Queen, I've just finished that this month, so I'm almost there. There are six books in total, every book, as I've said before, so I don't want to get too much into this again, but every book in The uh, Fairy Queen follows a knight and a virtue. And in this book we follow Artigol, who is the lover of Britomar, the female knight who was the protagonist of the previous two books of the poem, and the virtue that we focus on in this book is justice. I have to say I'm still enjoying this epic poem a lot, and actually I think this book might actually be one of my favourites, which at this point I was expecting to just be getting a bit drained and a bit tired because this is such a long poem, and I'm not gonna lie, I'm looking forward to just getting to the end of it just because I'm so close at this point, and it's, you know, I've been reading this, I think I started reading this in February, and it's now almost December, so it's taken me nearly a year to get this far and probably will take me a whole year to finish it. So I'm really looking forward to getting to the end of the poem, but I've definitely enjoyed the journey, and this book was really entertaining. It was more structured than the previous book, which I thought was a bit off the wall in places. And I also enjoyed the characters in this one, especially Artigol's companion that he has in this book. It is a Tin Man robot thing called Talos, and this machine will just go into towns where there are wrongdoers and will just, like, kill them indiscriminately. And this leads to some pretty funny scenes where they have to kind of try and rein him in because, you know, sometimes you don't want to just kill the bad guys, you know, you might want to forgive them or give them the option of, you know, making good for it, but this this Tin Man isn't having any of it. So <laughs> there were some fun parts in this book that I really enjoyed, and yeah, I'm still enjoying this poem and I would definitely recommend if you want a challenging read, then go for The Fairy Queen. The next book that I read this month was Confessions of a Mask by Yukio Mishima. This is a book that I actually read for a book club, and it's also a book that I'm going to be discussing next week on the channel because I really enjoyed this book. Essentially, it's an autobiographical or semi-autobiographical novel that tells the story of Ko-chan, who is a young man who discovers that he's gay, and he has to kind of come to terms with this, and he also discovers that he has some pretty dark and twisted ideas and obsessions. I'm not going to go into too much depth on this book, just because I'm going to talk about it a lot in a future video, but what I will say is, if you like a story that is very stark, very dark, and tells you about the dangers and horrors of things like sexual repression, then I think you will find a lot to enjoy in this book. Also, if you like stories that don't really have so much of a plot, and instead focus on the internal workings of very complex characters and their minds and their psychologies, then I think you will definitely enjoy this book, because as far as I'm concerned, it's probably one of the best, you know, first-person intimate narrator stories that I've ever read. The protagonist, Ko Chan, is just so complex. He is sympathetic, but also has some pretty, you know, dark thoughts, and he can be quite a cruel or cold person at times. And so, as a reader, you're just very conflicted about his character because he just has so much nuance and depth to him. It's definitely a book that, when you read it for the first time like I did, you'll co come to the end and you'll want to read it again. Maybe not straight away, because it is quite dark. But you will want to read it again to try and understand and get to the bottom of his character, because there is just so much there. And the writing style as well is very beautiful, it's very poetic, without being too long-winded and sluggish, which is perfect. And it's also a very short book, so if you want a classic on this kind of topic, on this kind of stuff, then I would definitely recommend reading it, because I think it's fantastic, and I am really looking forward to talking about this next week on the channel. On now to another classic that I read this month, which is also about sexuality, and that is Morris by E.M. Forster. This is also a book that has been picked for the book club. It's the next book that we're going to be looking at, and it's a book that I picked because I really wanted to contrast it with Confessions of a Mask. Again, it's a story about a gay man coming to terms with his sexuality, but it is done in a very different style from Confessions of a Mask, where Confessions of a Mask is a very intimate story, you know, work focusing on the internal mind of the character. Morris is much more about, you know, partly the psychology of the main character, but it's also about kind of society in general and how that affects sexuality. So it's more about kind of society, politics, and even religion in places, because it's set in the uh, early 19th century, 20th century, 
So it's a very different kind of book. It's more about being gay in, you know, a very repressed suburban middle class society. Whereas Confessions of a Mask, there is some politics there, but really is all about the internal workings of the mind of the character. I also picked the book because Morris is just one of my favourite books. I think it's a fantastic book, and I also think it's very underrated in E.M. Forster's own canon. Forster just has a great style. He is very readable, he's very sharp and witty, and I think he captures, even to this day, he captures the kind of banality and kind of boorishness of middle-class suburban life. Also what I like is that in terms of representing a gay character in a book, Forster spends a lot of time really showing Morris to be just a typical guy. He's not special in any real way, he's not very intelligent or very stupid, he is angry at things, he has flaws. In some places he's quite unlikable because he's quite, you know, he can be quite bitter, he can be quite cruel, and so you just get a character that feels very much like a human. And a bit like with Confessions of a Mask, that's kind of what you want from a story. You don't want a character that you can, you know, put on a pedestal as some kind of paragon of virtue or whatever. I mean, sometimes, you know, Fairy Queen kind of does that. But in general, if you really want to relate to a character and you really want to come back to a story again and again for those characters, you really want them to be, you know, full of depth and richness. And I also think in terms of just writing a story about homosexuality, you know, it meant a lot for Forster to, you know, demonstrate that Morris is just a regular guy. He's not anything special or some kind of weirdo or, you know, something that society can kind of put in a box and say you're other. And so I think that was a really good move, I think it's a really good book for that reason. Although this novel was written around 1913, 1914, uh, Forster never published it in his life. This was mainly because, spoiler alert, the story does have a relatively happy ending for the gay characters, and so Forster was worried that there would be significant backlash to this, which certainly there would have been. Despite that, I kind of wish he had had the courage to publish it, because not only do I think that would have been, you know, a, a great thing to have had back then, but also I think because it wasn't published in his lifetime, it's not quite as well regarded as some of his other works, with a lot of people kind of seeing it as one of his weaker novels. And you know, maybe it is, it's certainly possible that I might be biased in this, but I actually found that of his novels that I've read, and that's basically all of them, it's one of his most heartfelt stories, and you can really feel like he has an emotional connection to the story that he's telling. And so it comes across as much more sincere and honest and less stilted than some of his other work, although his other work is also really great. So yeah. If you're interested in reading some LGBT classics, I would definitely recommend reading either Morris or Confessions of a Mask, or like I'm doing in my book club, reading them both together and just seeing how you can get a very different uh, kind of novel, uh, but both of them are equally great and equally worth your time. So that's it for the classics that I read this month, now we're on to the fantasy that I read this month. First up we have The Last Battle, which is the last book in the Chronicles of Narnia series, by C.S. Lewis. So I recently finished my rereading of the whole Chronicles of Narnia series, and as I uh, suggested in my ranking video on that little plug, The Last Battle was one of the books that really changed my mind this time around. Now it's often regarded as one of the worst books in the series, and I still think it does have some pretty big flaws. I don't think that the villains in this book are as captivating as other villains in the series. I also feel like this book probably more than any other book, is really C.S. Lewis doing the allegory thing for Christianity a little bit too hard. He just kind of wants to create a, you know, Judgment Day kind of story. And so it does kind of feel a bit heavy-handed in places this time around. And you know, this is coming from someone who doesn't really mind the allegory stuff all that much. So it must be pretty heavy-handed if I'm <laughs> noticing it this time and complaining about it. All those little criticisms aside though, I did find that this book, as a conclusion to the series, was actually a lot more emotionally charged than I remember it being when I read it when I was younger. Even though it is steeped in allegory, the final passage or parts where we're going through the end of Narnia and you see this world that you've, you know, lived and breathed for the past six books dying and these characters going on to another world, it was just really affecting and emotional and Lewis just had a really, you know, he's always had a beautiful writing style and I do think he does these kinds of cosmic event sorts of stuff. I think he does them really well. It reminded me a lot of The Magician's Nephew, where you have the creation story, and I always found that stuff really beautiful, even if, again, it is very allegorical. Another thing that I liked about the book is that it's not afraid to go to some pretty dark places. You know, the fates of the children are all pretty tragic, especially Susan, who gets left behind, which we can, you know, we could go off and have a debate about that, but uh, not for this video. But 
you know, it's, it's a pretty tragic book. It's a pretty dark book. And I think when I was younger, I just didn't really appreciate that very much. And maybe I just, I don't know, just didn't connect with it. But now, being a little bit older and reading it, I just found it to be a lot more poignant. And it was much, you know, it was really well written as well. So, yeah, there are some flaws, but I did enjoy this book a lot more this time around. And now we're coming to a book that is definitely going to be on the top of my best reads of this year. And that is the second book in the Gormenghast trilogy, also called Gormenghast. The Gormenghast trilogy tells the story of Titus Grone, who is the 77th heir to the throne of Gormenghast, which is a desolate kingdom that's basically cut off from the rest of the world by swamps and mountains and dangerous forests. And all of the nobles live in Gormenghast Castle, which is this huge labyrinth-like thing that's sprawling, it's all falling to bits. And everyone in this castle and everyone in Gormenghast the Kingdom is just a slave to traditions that have been going on for so long. That none of them actually know why they follow these traditions, but they just do it mindlessly. And so you just get a cast of crazy characters. They're all insane. Uh, and it's really hard to describe in a way because it's a very character focused book. But essentially the story of Titus Grown, and in this second book especially, it's him reacting to this overbearing tradition and rebelling against it. In the first book, which is equally good, you know, equally good if not... I find it hard to say which of these two books I enjoyed more. At the minute it's the second one, because I've just finished it. But I think I'll have to read them again and then decide which one I like more. But in the first book, Titus is a baby, so we don't really follow him all that much. Instead, we follow his family and the other inhabitants of the castle. And then in the second book, we focus much more on Titus and his development and rebellion. But to me, this is just a perfect series. It's got the kind of whimsy and zaniness of some of the best fantasy novels without really having any explicit fantasy elements in it. There's no magic system, there's no ghosts, at least in these first two books. I believe that magic might get involved in the third one based on Wikipedia. I haven't read the third book yet, so do correct me if I'm wrong on that. But at least in these first two books, there aren't explicit fantasy elements aside from the seeming medieval setting and the world in which it takes place doesn't seem to be our world. It's also a gothic novel. You have this huge castle. There are some scenes in the book where people are murdered that are downright terrifying. It's like stuff from, you know, gothic classics like Dracula at points. And it's a classic. So, you know, it's all of the things that I review on this channel combined into, well, not just one book, but several books. And it's just fantastic, and I can't recommend this book enough if you haven't read it before. In terms of this specific book as well, what I really liked is that it did everything that I really hoped that it would do. So just a bit of background on the Gorman Guest trilogy. The author, Mervyn Peake, he did actually plan for the series to continue, and basically it would cover Titus's whole, well not his whole life, but at least his life up until he was in his 40s, I think, was what I read about it. But tragically, Mervyn Peake died, so was unable to complete the series. And I was always worried with this, because, you know, if a series isn't finished, there's the worry that you will get to a point where it just kind of stops, and you don't get any kind of resolution. Now, even though there is still a third book to go, the first two books, as they are, it really seemed to me like you could just stop the book. You could just stop the series at this point, and it would be completely satisfying. Yes, the ending is open-ended, but it was open-ended in a way in which most of the key elements of the story had been resolved. And so, even if, you know, you, you would wonder what would happen in the future to these characters, you don't need to, because the result, you know, the story itself has been resolved, if that makes sense. This was great, because I, I really was worried that that wasn't going to happen, and that I would really enjoy this series, but then it would just stop, and I'd never know, you know, the answers to it, which would be a real shame. But yeah, I just can't recommend Gorman Guest enough. The characters are all fantastic in their own unique ways. They all have a lot of time to develop and change, especially between the first and second books. I think in the first book, some of the characters do feel a bit one-dimensional, but in the second book, certain things happen that just bring out new sides to their characters and they change and grow in huge ways. So I think, you know, combining these two books together, and seeing it as one big combined novel, you really do get a great progression for all of these really great characters. Peek also just has a really wonderful writing style. He's really funny, 
but also can get pretty dark for those, you know, scary murder scenes and things. But yeah, he just does everything that I want from a writer, and so you know, it's definitely going to be on my best of 2020 list, and it's probably going to be one of my favourite books slash series of all time. And that's everything that I read this November. So before I wrap up, just a quick update on the future videos on the channel. So next week I will be uploading my Confessions of a Mask review slash analysis video. But after that I'm going to be doing some top 5 videos for classics, for gothic literature and for fantasy, focusing on the best in the genres of the books that I read this year. So be on the lookout for those in the coming weeks. But that's it for this video though, so take care everyone and I'll see you all next time.